Thank you so much for joining us, Kavita. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I think that today one of, the, one of the things I find so interesting about blockchain is that even though it is a very new technology, it has somehow managed to bring together lots of people from different backgrounds. And I think that's something I'm personally very interested in hearing when I speak to some people. So I was wondering whether you can tell us how you got your start in blockchain and what you used to do before you got into blockchain. Um, bef before I started working on blockchain investments, I was still doing next generation technology investments at Eric Schmidt family office. And before that, World Bank and IFC. And it has always been personally for me coming from an engineering school is how to cultivate an ecosystem to invest into something which is going to come two years, three years in the future, which is going to change what currently we use. And that has always been my career last 17 years. And for blockchain was very interesting, going back to what you said. Um, my first experience, I mean, I was watching crypto space, uh, which hopefully most of the people in, in this audience have been. Um, but blockchain as a technology first came to my attention when I was at MIT Solve. And one of the entrepreneurs pitched the idea about using blockchain for refugee identity solution on the border with UNHCR. And it was very interesting because especially when you're working with Eric and the whole Google area and you're talking about decentralization and of data specifically and, uh, and a data which is not owned by an entity or an identity uh, as a company, uh, that got a lot of attention. And I was like, the, will this actually practically work? or this will be killed by somebody in like two days or acquired by somebody to disappear, like we have seen tons of things going. And uh, so I followed that path for like three months. I advised that company till they went into being incubation lab actually at UNHCR and one of their products are being used at Cree. So that's how it started. But I met the founder, co-founder of Ethereum and founder of Consensus, Joseph Lubin, at one of the World Bank IFC next technology leader summit and after three and a half hour of long debate and conversation i was a convert so and when's the first time you heard about blockchain and cryptocurrency because you mentioned that you first heard about cryptocurrency and then you cryptocurrency actually i think when you are in a fintech space you are everyone is talking about is it a hoax is it a bubble is it something like a ponzi scheme people are making money off so from bitcoin to like ether launch to like dot dot coins and i don't know how many different coins coming into the market so every vc has been in especially in san francisco because this this is one of the first technology where it did not happen in sf so the bay area silicon valley as we call it has been watching it as an outsider. So there was always the conversation because people didn't know what's going on. And then suddenly people started talking about technology. I think Ethereum changed that conversation from crypto to technology part. And that's how a lot of technology enthusiasts got interested in it. So one of the things I found interesting about you and your background in traditional investment was that I noticed that when you moved to Consensus Ventures, you came up with this new way of investing into coins because investing in cryptocurrency in, in general, ICOs are so much different than normal IPOs. And I was wondering, can you let us know how you worked it out and how you usually, what, what things you consider when, when looking into companies to invest in? So it all came from that three and a half hour conversation which I told you with Joe. So our conversation started with me pretty much like trying to make a point that Yes, you can take a lot of things away from traditional VC, but how are you going to take away the years of experience, strategy, hiring, a uh, lot, of, lot of support system which a VC brings in on the table? And what is the valuation methods for these tokens? Like, who are these people who are investing $200 million in ICO without ever meeting a founder based on like a white paper, which a founder can change tomorrow morning. So there is no guarantee that the founder is going to stick to that company, stick to the idea based on which you have actually put in money, and where are the milestones based on which that money is going to be spent. Like, there is no transparency, there is no accountability, and isn't that the ether of blockchain? So for me, it just didn't make sense. Um, 
how, do, how are people investing in tokens? And so that conversation from one to another came to this hybrid model where uh, we said that over time, and which has now actually happened in US with the SEC, that investing in utility tokens should not be the job of investors. Uh, what investors should be doing is a combination of equity and token to match out and provide a type of milestones to the founders to match and then start taking money. For an example, if a founder wants to do an MVP, they really don't need $100 million in their bank account. What are they going to do with that? So why don't, if the whole company needs $100 million over next four years or five years, how about we create eight different milestones, go back to the market, every six months or eight months, show what you have built up, and then raise the next 10 million or next 5 million tranche. So that's how we started working with our companies. That sounds pretty good. Uh, I was wondering, so at Consensus Ventures, you recently closed another round of investments. You invested in six new companies. And before that, you had another round earlier last, uh, last, last year in December, December yeah. with another four companies. And I was just wondering, what are some of the things that you look for in projects? And uh, can you tell us more about how the whole process goes? Do you have an internal um, guidelines for selecting those things? How yeah, so we invest pre-seed and seed across the whole Web 3.0 stack. So whether it's infrastructure layer, protocol, application, security, exchanges, financial products, because this market is so new and it's completely coming up that there's no point to restrict ourselves saying, oh, we're just going to be at protocol layer because we don't know where the market will move even tomorrow morning. So we invest across everything, but we are very sure we don't invest if it's the usage of blockchain is for ERC-20 token. Though a lot of, so that takes away 92% of the project anyways, because that's all they want to do. They want to basically come and launch tokens and say, oh, but our financial transaction layer is on ERC-20. And as soon as that happens, somebody from the team quickly works around and the call is over. Um, so what is the real usage of blockchain? Um, whether it is used for computational power, whether it is actually used for transactions by providing some sort of scalability, like what is the use of blockchain authentication or Trump. So uh, we go down deep onto the usage of blockchain. And then I think a lot of traditional VC thing, which is the market sizing, what, what's the team, uh, whether they are industry specific or they are technology specific, and what is a seamless way for I always think, like, if this company in five years will grow big, will my mom or my dad would be able to use it without really knowing what blockchain is or without really knowing how to use tokens? Because that's where the future has to go. Today, nobody talks about TCP IP. Probably, if you don't go to engineering college, most of the kids don't even know what TCP IP is. But, uh, that's the, that's the whole internet layer right there. People don't even think about it. They just assume as a fact that this just exists. And that's how the blockchain technology should be. Uh, I'm, I wanted to touch on, so you mentioned that one of the most important things that you consider when looking at investment opportunities is what their use for blockchain is. Uh, and I was wondering, do you have also, can you also share with us some of the red flags when you're, you're looking at companies and maybe if you can give us an example of some of the most ridiculous uh, concepts for, for ICOs and tokens that you've seen out there. Oh. You don't need me to mention the name. <laughs> no, I, no. I, I mean, you. I'm just thinking about the most ridiculous one because I just started thinking there's so many of them. Like, <laughs> 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 which one is the most ridiculous one? It just, there is always one joke during the eight, 10 hour working day that there would be one company which would come, which is like, oh my God, this is our five minute joke day, joke minute. Um, there was this company who wanted to do uh, dog poop service on the coin. So if you clean someone's, some dog's poop on the street, you get like a reward point. And I'm like, wow, this is great. First, I need to clean a dog's poop. And then I have to go on my app, prove it, that I've actually done it. And then I'll get some dog's coin. And then I'm supposed to make money out of it. So I'm like, if I'm smart enough to do all this thing, I, I'm, I can create a business without blockchain. <laughs> Authentication of poop on blockchain. I think that's what Vitalik created Ethereum for. <laughs> I think that's what the blockchain was made for, yeah, yeah. in general. Um, so I was wondering also, Basically, you've recently launched uh, 
an accelerator plan program for, for blockchain companies. And I was wondering, what is going to be the purpose of that program and how are you going to be helping companies? What is the, are you going to, going to be giving them guidance? Are you going to be helping them with, with sourcing team members and just building up their operation? Yeah, so uh, the name of the accelerator is Tachyon. Uh, which is uh, an ion faster than the speed of light? Yes. I think, uh, so it's very embarrassing. I didn't know that. Joe told me. And uh, now I think Tachyon is going to be so famous, physics major or not, everybody is going to know about it. Um, when we started investing, we realized that we were facing two big problems in the ecosystem. First, really great engineers from some of the top companies like Google, Uber, Facebook, who are currently in very cushioned jobs, needed a little bit more to start experimenting in blockchain world and to leave their jobs to do something new. So we started thinking, how do we create a sort of a place for an eight-week program for people to come and say, this is a great idea, this is the team that we have, and we're going to try to come to an MVP by the end of eight weeks. So early, very, very early ideation stage and incubation stage. So that was one group of people we were targeting. The other group of people were really big industry experts who are coming and they know their space, like for an example, travel industry. So we have somebody who knows how airline ticketing works. But either they have to find a contracting company on blockchain to work with them to actually create the technical architecture, which is not bad, but then that's not the 100% in-house company product. So how do we actually take those people and give them an atmosphere of how this blockchain community and ecosystem work? So these were initially how we started looking at the target group to increase very high quality companies in the space. And so the eight-week program, it's just a terminology accelerator, though it's very different than any of the existing ones because the first one week is education, blockchain 101. So even if you're coming from the technical background, you will have some of the most uh, amazing coders like Joseph Chow, Gonzalo, Daniel Novi, et cetera, coming and just doing blockchain 101, a lot of coding, a lot of hacking out there. Uh, trying to create a lot of that community of those people working together, irrespective of what their idea is. And then after that three weeks, they're going to go back, work on their idea, refine it based on the knowledge they pick, come back, and that is the time when we are doing something. The second thing which is very exciting is we are getting 15 to 20 advisors from the traditional Web 2.0 world, which are pr uh, product heads, UX, UI designers, uh, marketing people from Google, Facebook, etc., and combining them with the deep tech uh, founders from the blockchain consensus ecosystem. So that every company has a product guy uh, as a mentor and then a blockchain person as a mentor. So combination of that is, I think, is going to be the future of how we see the company so that we can take care of the knowledge what we already have and the knowledge we need to fill in for the future. So I assume that part of investing in companies and helping them build their companies uh, is also has the idea to profit from that. And I, so far you have 10 investments and uh, at, you haven't really exited a position yet. But I was wondering when you first came up with the idea for Consensus Ventures last year before the launch, did you, you obviously, must have had a conversation about that. What is your strategy for exiting those positions? Mm -hmm. And uh, when do you see, when do you think you're going to make your first exit, if you had to make an ex a guesstimation? So this is a very interesting world. A company doesn't have to get acquired for us to have liquidity. We hold tokens for most of the companies along with equity investments in them. That's how we invest in them. So if we do want, we can go and make at least 4x, 5x in a lot of places um, tomorrow. But the way we work with the companies is uh, we actually push them to have six month lock-in period. We ourselves actually, uh, we ourselves goes and say, hey, we want six month lock-in period because we want people uh, to build the companies. And consensus as a brand, we go as a strategy partner always, not just as a liquidity partner. So we have not, as you said, uh, liquidate or dilute any of our position in any of the companies. So 
we are waiting for one year mark for each of our company individual investments to start seeing how the market is and then probably start circulating some of the tokens as the market moves. Um, and one, I think I also had a question. So from the 10 companies you've invested so far, which one is your favorite example? And why do you think it, they, they've got a good use case for having a token? Um, I can't say which one is my favorite. I think all of them are okay. amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll give you two examples. One example where tokens did not make sense, so the company didn't do it. And one example where tokens absolutely make sense, right? So BlockFi, one of our first investment, is a crypto lending platform. And they have competitors whom I can't name, but like pretty famous competitor who hasn't done any lend much lending yet, started with the token sale. The, the point is when you are doing a loan service and you are already managing your risk on the token side and also on the ether side, you don't want to create another layer of, uh, another layer of risk out there. So BlockFi made a very good decision. They haven't done their tokens or are not thinking in that direction so far. Um, on the other side, a project like Dada, which is an art collectible project, where you're taking the middleman out, authenticated the art pieces, needs a smart contract, where a smart contract defines that every time this, paint, this particular art item keeps on getting sold, the artist keeps on getting money back. So even in the secondary market. So a non-fungible token uh, just absolutely makes sense. There is no other way you can actually create a financial system around it. So That makes perfect sense. One of the buzzwords that comes, that pops up a lot in, in talks of decentral decentral decentralization and blockchain is the token economy. What, what is your opinion of the token economy and uh, how would you describe it? Token economy is a very interesting world, which we have to talk about like 30 times a day. <laughs> 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 it's like my favorite word now uh, without even knowing it. But um, it's changing and it's evolving. When I started in this space, utility token was the only reality. And people were talking about there may be security token, there may be something else. Today, we are already talking about governance token, protocol tokens, utility tokens. Uh, then there is some sort of new types of internal work model, work tokens. And then, of course, security and non-fungible tokens. So I think token economics is going to end up becoming a Wikipedia of itself over the next two years. And we're going to have like books and classes and I don't know what. But token economics today for us ultimately lies is whether this company needs a token if there is a token among all the categories, which token makes sense, which SEC will also approve and would not send us subpoenas. And then how people can really hold those tokens and those can be traded in any of the exchanges as a structure product. So I think token economics is ultimately end up on a balance sheet with asset and liability, but it goes through this whole new process, which is a unique combination of hedge fund and equity investments. Thank you so much, Kavita, for uh, enlightening us about the token economy and investing in blockchain. We've run out of time, but it was yeah. a pleasure. Very nice.